no, water off. Ooh, recording in progress, yes. Okay, uh, we're grateful that you can be here. This webinar is part of a series of, of outreach events for us to help to uh, educate volunteers, educate anyone interested in trail stuff about some of the endeavors that the Superior Hiking Trail has been pursuing. This webinar is being hosted by the Superior Hiking Trail Association, but is supported by the NOAA Office of Coastal Management Funds made available by the DNR Lake Superior Coastal Program. So we're really grateful to have that support to make events like this possible. My name is Joe Swanson. I'm the Trail Development Director for the Superior Hiking Trail Association. And here at SHTA, we've been building and maintaining the trail for over 35 years. And we're excited to continually improve the trail and ensure that it's around for upcoming generations. We have a lot of work to do to make our trail resilient and sustainable and understanding the impacts of water is a huge part of that. So we're really grateful that you all are interested in this topic and, and willing to, to learn more about it. We're really excited to uh, have Tim Malzan here with us today of uh, Trail Eyes LLC. He has over 20 years of experience with building re resilient and really cool trails. I have had the opportunity to hike a lot of miles of trail that Tim has worked on. And it's, uh, it's a totally different experience from hiking a trail that, that hasn't necessarily been uh, sustainably placed. So we're really excited that he is willing to come and give us some of his wisdom and uh, also do some trail projects for us. He just finished up a big project on the Split Rock River Loop. So we're grateful for, uh, for his, his willingness to be here bright and early this morning. So before I turn it over to Tim, uh, because you don't need to hear me talking all morning, we're here for Tim, but just a few announcements that we are uh, still fairly new to hosting virtual events. So if you do have technical difficulties during, during the webinar, you can feel free to put, put it in the chat box and we'll see what we can do. <laughs> we'll see if we can, can help you out. Uh, also, if you have questions throughout the, throughout the presentation, we will have some opportunities to ask those, but you can also just put them in the chat box when you think of them so that you don't you know, for, forget what you wanted to ask. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Tim. Hey, thank you very much, Joe, and, and good morning, everyone, um, on a fine Friday to, to begin. Uh, question, can everyone see my screen? Uh, should be a, a, an image that says people on, water off, building and maintaining a resilient superior hiking trail. If so, just give me a thumbs up, maybe somebody. All right, nice job. Thank you for that. Uh, so this is uh, uh, session two of four. Uh, today, of course, is people on, water off. And tonight we'll be talking about uh, trail eyes and trail assessment. Uh, and then again on Saturday morning, we'll revisit that topic as well. So people on water off um, is, as Joe just described, really critical to uh, the trail experience and to trail sustainability. Let's see if we can go to the next one here. And just to back up what Joe said on the, on the NOAA, the Lake Superior Coastal Program, uh, thanks to them for providing some help with uh, the Superior Hiking Trail Association and myself being able to spend some time to put this information together. And always love talking uh, trail dynamics and, and uh, geeking out here with uh, ideation and working with folks to improve and better understand natural surface trails. So our goals for, for this 
training is to gain understanding of the principles of sustainable trail building and trail stewardship techniques. What are they? And importantly, to try to increase our understanding of the why behind the topics we're going to be talking about and the more resilient design decisions of the Superior Hiking Trail Association uh, that the association is making moving forward. And that's well and fine, but the real crux of the matter is to then apply this knowledge on the trail. So that's where we're headed today. How we'll spend our time for the next uh, 90 minutes or so is taking a look at what is the trail experience? What brings people to the trail in the first place? We'll have a look at trail shapes and anatomy and what makes resilient trails. And then I've got a big bucket here called hydrologically invisible, which takes a look at what water was doing before the trail was established and what it's doing after the trail is in use. I'm not sure exactly how many people are on this. Uh, let's say it's about 15. So if we were in a room together right now, I would ask everyone to tell me what you think a trail is. What is the definition of trail? And we would probably get about 15, probably related, but at the same time, very different responses. So let's talk a little bit about that. And that trail types range from what I'll characterize as utilitarian to experiential. Uh, utilitarian examples would include what's called troads or in forest service terminology, trouts. Uh, these are former logging and farm roads or resource extraction routes, uh, maybe a fire break in prairie settings or along utility corridors, hunter walking paths or as simple as a path that links one campsite to another. These examples, utilitarian, are usually existing routes uh, that were created for non-recreational trail purposes, but have been adopted for recreational use. So their origin, where they're located, how they were established is vastly different from the needs of sustainable recreational trail development. Experiential trail examples include, of course, the Superior Hiking Trail, North Country Trail, uh, park settings, nature educational trails for cultural or historical interpretation. It can include trails established for river or lake access, uh, for fishing and water-based recreation. Of course, trails intended for hiking, for skiing, walking, biking, snowshoeing, running. Uh, many of those uses do overlap, although there are distinctions uh, in terms of the trail design and management for each of those uses. Uh, trails can be dirt surface, they can be paved, they can be hardened with stone aggregate, uh, they can be motorized, non-motorized. So the point of this is that there isn't a single definition that truly captures all types of trails and all types of uses. For our purposes, uh, the definition that I uh, would like to ask you to keep in mind and to embrace is that a trail is an area of focused impact that's managed as an outdoor recreational facility 
and reacts to and interprets the landscape. We'll be returning to those three statements, shall we say, throughout our time together today. Uh, but in brief, the focused impact part of this definition is intended to keep people on the trail and to reduce environmental impacts that result from introducing the trail into the natural environment. Outdoor recreational facility. So facilities, we, it may not be intuitive to think of a hiking trail or let's call it a, a dirt scratch through the woods uh, as a facility, uh, as we would think of a power station or your house or your vehicle. Uh, but in fact, trails are most definitely an outdoor recreational facility. And as such, uh, the upkeep, the maintenance, uh, the continual investment of time, expertise, and yes, dollars um, to maintain that facility, the trail, um, is very important. And without it, uh, we have a loss of trail, uh, a degradation of the environment, and a lessening of the trail experience. The third statement here is that a trail reacts to and interprets the landscape. And that is most definitely in the experiential realm. And for many is the reason that we are using trails. So a way to possibly summarize um, that long explanation is to think of trails uh, as the Tao, as the Tao of trails. And the expression art and science is used to describe trail design and trail management fairly often. And what that refers to is that the way a trail moves through, reacts to and interprets the landscape is the art. That's the realm of aesthetics and, uh, and beauty. The way that a trail sheds water focuses human impacts and anticipates future conditions. That's more on, on the science realm. The trail experience. There are as many uh, different motivations for being out of doors and recreating on trails uh, as there are types of trail users. Uh, the motivations for being out of doors can be mind boggling and really surprise us that someone is out for one block of reasons that seem very different from the reasons that we are out. But uh, others, other people's motivations for recreating are not necessarily ours to judge, but it is our responsibility as trail stewards um, to learn about them and include them in our awareness as we are doing our work. For many, it's uh, nature observation. It's the sight, the sounds, the smells of, of being out of doors. The upper right picture, that's a, a couple that if you notice the uh, notebook or maybe it's a guidebook tucked under the gentleman's uh, right arm. Uh, budding mycologists is uh, what brought them to the trail on that particular day. The middle right picture, vistas, uh, big views, water. Uh, these are very, very powerful draws for people uh, to experience 
on the trail. And of course, the Superior Hiking Trail has an abundance of uh, those themes. Uh, bottom right, hiking, long distance hiking in particular. And we're seeing a couple of, couple of young men who are on, a, on the Superior Hiking Trail on an adventure. And look how happy they are, uh, gaining confidence and belief in themselves while they're out. Top left, volunteering. Volunteering is an incredibly rich experience, uh, incredibly learning. And um, I like to use an expression called trail building is people building. And so that's something that, that I realized many years ago. Uh, and it's not just about drumming up a workforce, it's about forming uh, common bonds and a shared vision. Volunteering is a great way to be out on the trail and to learn as well. Bottom left, many trail users have entirely different, uh, an entirely different purpose for being on the trail than hiking, skiing or running, it uh, may be fishing or some other um, form of wildlife viewing families. Uh, great way to, to connect with people. I think one of the things that trails do with, with a family unit or interpersonal relationships is it kind of levels the playing field uh, because we're in a neutral and new environment together. So some of our baggage stays behind and we are encouraged to connect with each other. And the last picture I've got on this topic on the right-hand side is alluding to uh, a sense of wonder, of inspiration uh, drawn from, I was gonna say the miraculous, but maybe that's a little strong. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but the, the wonders of uh, nature. When the Superior Hiking Trail Association launched the trail renewal program, which is, I think it was, you know, forming in 2017 and, and really kind of hit the market, shall we say, in 2018, I was watching from a distance and had learned about it. And I thought, this is brilliant. Um, this, this really gets to the heart, the core and the purpose of a volunteer organization that partners with governmental agencies uh, to steward a long distance trail. So I was, I was very impressed with it. And as we think about trail sustainability, um, there's an adage in the trail world um, and in the planning realms of uh, the three-legged stool. And for trail purposes, um, the three legs consist of the physical, the environmental, and the social realm. Um, that description is evolving somewhat to also in, uh, include economics and inclusion and diversity, uh, but there's room in the stool for all of that. The physical component is the ability of the land to support recreational trail use with minimal impacts to the natural reoccurring processes of an area. Uh, that description you might also want to think of as the carrying capacity of the land. What is the land's ability to absorb and accommodate um, the numbers of trail users and the type of trail use that we are proposing? Environmental, uh, the middle leg in our diagram. Um, the trail will be sustainable if there is negligible soil loss or movement, which is summarized by the term erosion, while allowing the naturally occurring plant systems to inhabit the area. 
social that's a pretty pretty broad leg uh, will the trail accommodate the existing and future uses um, that it receives will it anticipate the future conditions uh, will will the trail corridor require minimal relocations and maintenance over extended periods of time. So that's, that's what the three-legged stool is. And each of these processes, the physical, the environmental, the social, as well as the economic, are, are all happening simultaneously. So trail stewardship and trail management is most definitely a three-dimensional model. My view of a really critical element of trail sustainability is the shape itself that the trail takes. Why? Because the shape of the trail can provide and should provide many places for water to want to get off of the pathway. So in the top photo, uh, I'm gonna see if my cursor gets up here. Uh, hopefully you see it waving around by the trail shapes on the left. And now I'm going to the top right photo. In this picture, at this point in the trail, water will exit, uh, whether the water is coming from the top where my cursor is moving or whether it's coming along here. This is a lower point that's designed and built to be lower to allow water to get off the trail. It also has, uh, you, you can't see it, you wouldn't know it from this picture, but there's a wonderful little ephemeral pond that happens here and people it encourages people to slow down, to pause, uh, to listen, and to look at what's happening around that pond. Uh, additionally, in on the slope, and this is about a 35% slope, water that, that hits the surface at the top of the slope is going to drain down and continue to sheet across the pathway to not be captured, but continue on. Um, in our bottom picture right here is a designed feature uh, to drain the, this leg of the trail. This is a design feature, a swale to get water off the trail. And the outslope of the trail continues through this area. And it's also fun. You know, it, it meanders and it gives us a different point of view to see different aspects of the environment that we're passing through. Trail shapes generally influence our I would say that trail shapes are generally the most important part of trail sustainability. What are those shapes? Uh, from the left, straight line. Straight line shapes are the hardest shapes to manage for appropriate use uh, and to drain water from in most cases. They tend to be on flatter terrain without a lot of topography to work with and without very much topography to work with, our trail shaping techniques are more limited and they become more intensive to do. Uh, the, the Moving to the right, the next shape, a curve shape. That adds interest and it does allow for uh, increased amount of trail drainage opportunities. Our third shape is curvilinear, uh, which builds on the curve and introduces even more opportunities to get water off the trail. And our fourth shape on the right-hand side of the screen 
is the best one in many respects uh, because it has lots of opportunities for us to get water off the trail, to add interest, which keeps people wanting to continue on the trail and stay on the footpath, focusing impact. Having a little trouble with my uh, mouse here, but looks like we're getting there. The picture we're looking at now is from Cascade River State Park uh, on the Superior Hiking Trail. And the trail shape that we're seeing is curved. And as we look at it and in the vegetation surrounding the trail, I'm not seeing people wandering off. I'm seeing that the use here is uh, well focused. And I especially like uh, our tree on the left, which is a northern white cedar. And I especially like being able to see um, the vegetation and the grasses. I think that's horsetail, but I'm not positive. Uh, maybe somebody can correct me when we take a little break on that if I'm wrong. Trail tread is all, all good, um, but it really begins with the trail corridor. Um, the trail corridor, the three key requirements of a trail corridor is that it is open and passable. Secondly, that it's safe for, intend, for the intended audience, uh, safe being Obstructions are minimized, including overhead, such as uh, damaged trees, uh, often known as whittle makers, uh, falling, coming across the trail. And thirdly, that it is signed and it is navigable. Uh, that gives people confidence, in fact, that they are uh, on a trail uh, and on the trail that they think they're on. <laughs> so on your casual walks, uh, what can you do as a trail steward uh, that may be outside of an organized event, but you can contribute maybe, uh, you know, 10 minutes, five minutes of, of time, maybe 20 or, or more uh, while you're just out walking the dog or going for a an afternoon stroll or a morning run to uh, start off the day or to decompress from the day. Uh, if you're willing to carry a small hand pruners or maybe even a small lopper or folding saw uh, to nip and clear overhanging vegetation from the trail corridor, it's a little, but Cumulatively, it adds a lot to keeping the trail open and passable. Um, a second thing that you can do is in our, our picture on the left uh, of the gentleman who is a park ranger uh, trying to climb over some downed trees. Now, I'm not suggesting carrying a, a chainsaw or even necessarily a, a, there's a really great saw called the Silky uh, Kataba Big Boy. Uh, it's a wonderful piece of uh, equipment that you can carry in your pack. It's a little big for the back pocket, but I'm not suggesting necessarily that, that you're taking either of those items out. But odds are throughout the 300 plus miles of the Superior Hiking Trail, there have been Sawyers along every foot of it uh, in the past. And so often what we find is and it's no fault of the Sawyers um, because they're doing what they're out there to do, cutting and bucking down trees and uh, logs to keep the trail open and passable. But so often what happens is that many, much of that cut material is just left on the very side of the trail. And what that does in many cases is it's, 
uh, that down bucked material will start to block water from exiting the edge of the trail. And if you're willing to pick up or tip over cut logs to get them farther away from the trail, ideally they're, they're uh, 10 steps away, but even just tipping it over and moving it three feet, five feet will help uh, for drainage. And it also facilitates ongoing maintenance for vegetative clearing and on a more advanced level for tread work. So that could be really helpful. And if you are doing any cutting or pruning of uh, small diameter trees, let's say not greater than four inches in diameter um, or small woody undergrowth or limbs that are overhanging the trail, instead of cutting like an overhanging branch, um, just the portion that's over the trail, go back to the tree trunk itself and use this method if you, if you have a handsaw, which is the three cut method. Uh, your first cut is, oh, at least six inches, maybe a foot uh, away from the trunk of the tree. And you're cutting, you're making an undercut that goes about a quarter or a third of the way through that limb. Your second cut comes from the top down. And what that'll do then is this, if you see my cursor um, in the black and white photo, this part of the branch will fall down and the bark will not peel off or banana peel uh, at the trunk. So that's the purpose of these two cuts. And then your third cut is back at the collar of the trunk. And it's about an inch or so out. And you'll finish removing that with a straight cut down so that we don't have pruning that looks like the center picture at the bottom of the tree. It's, uh, it's unsightly, it's not healthy for the tree. And uh, I wouldn't want to like lean up against that tree and take a break or anything necessarily either. So give ourselves just a moment to take a breath. And uh, next we'll talk about constructed tread and what the anatomy of a construct full bench constructed tread is and why we do it and the benefits uh, that constructed trail brings to the landscape. So full bench tread construction is the bread and butter of sustainable trails. And the baseline of trails building skill development. So the different components of what we're looking at here, and there'll be uh, two other diagrams right after this slide, is uh, starting at the bottom of the screen, the back line. This area is where the back line exists. And what the back line is, is it's a point of reference from which the remaining three steps follow. It's like a hinge. Uh, from the back line is where the tread will, uh, tread being the actual surface of the trail that we are walking on. That's where the tread, or in this diagram, it's called the bench and the bench width. That's where it begins. So uh, Superior Hiking Trail, for the most part, is about a 24 inch wide uh, bench or tread standard. Uh, lots of the Superior Hiking Trail is 18 or even 12 inches. And there are portions of the Superior Hiking Trail that are five feet or more wide, not necessarily intended. Um, but the full bench tread construction does a tremendous amount to focus impact and to shed water. The, Back line, the bench, the, the back slope area where my cursor is moving is a transition 
zone from the native slope uh, to the, the bench and then across for water to flow down and across the slope uh, that the trail is sited on. The critical edge is the outside shoulder of, of the walking path. And it's called critical because that is usually the place where water is blocked from sheeting across the tread because of soil accumulation that occurs over time uh, and with use, which water will then no longer able to exit the tread, it'll flow down the trail. And as it's flowing down the trail, it's taking soil, it's rutting and causing a whole lot more work to happen in the future. And if the work doesn't happen, uh, we'll see some examples of what that's gonna look like too. So full bench trail construction. Um, here's a couple of more diagrams, top left, the dashed, line shows what the native surface of the slope that this trail is sited on uh, was first done. So we are shaping soil. We're removing soil from hillside settings uh, to create this constructed tread. And then we have uh, a little simpler drawing of what uh, we looked at previously. So I'm hoping that makes sense, uh, at least from an uh, intellectual standpoint for you. And even more so, uh, this will really come into focus if you volunteer uh, on, uh, on a trail crew, small or large event, it won't matter um, to get a Pickmatic in your hand. And I gotta do a shout out for Pickmatics because it's, uh, a key trail building tool. And it's been around for a long time. And in fact, it was standard issue to Roman legionnaires way, way back in the day because they used it uh, for making paths, uh, uh, access roads, et cetera. Here are some examples of constructed tread. And I'll use my cursor again, starting in the uh, bottom left picture to just identify the, the four main pieces of constructed trail. So where my cursor is moving now is the back line. And it's when, when you do build constructed tread, what you'll find is you need to reestablish this back line while you're doing the other components to probably keep going a little deeper uh, to establish the, the bench and just to uh, guide you through the rest of the steps that depend on and hinge off of the back line. So that's the back line. Hey, Tim, I'm, uh, I'm just gonna jump in here for a second to say that we're not currently seeing your cursor. We were seeing it earlier and for some reason it has disappeared. So just, you know, you can, you can describe the part you're talking about, but know that we're, we're not seeing the cursor. Okay, thanks so much. For sure. Um, so with that, I think we can just have a look at these pictures and see how they feel to you. See how, how these three examples of trail look. Is it a place that you would want to walk? In doing trail assessments and, and looking at trail sections to find what's happening here, uh, the one over three rule uh, can be of great help to us. And what that's saying, uh, do you see my cursor now, Joe? I, yeah, it, it is back. I don't okay. know what you did, but good job. All right. Um, the diagram in the upper right of your screen is representing the one over three. And what that is telling us is, 
let's say we're on a 25% side slope. And, and this is measured with a tool called the clinometer. Very simple tool, fits in your pocket, costs about $125. And that tells us we're on a 25% slope. And then we're taking various readings along the trail route here. And what we find is we've got an average trail grade of 15%. We also see that we've got an erosion problem occurring because water is staying on and flowing down the trail. And the one over three rule says, uh, hold on a second here, folks, because you're on a 25% side slope your trail grade should not exceed uh, about 8% for water to shed off of the trail. And it holds true in the very, very large majority of cases. Our bottom diagram, which our only diagram now, uh, is that same image and it shows the 25% cross slope with an 8% trail growth. In this case, water will flow across the trail that is coming from upslope and it will exit. The whole key to uh, water management with trails is to take as little, or excuse me, to take a little from as many places off the trail as we can. Uh, what the one over three, paradigm looks like in the field is that the yellowish orange shape here is where we measure the cross slope. And in this case, it's 40%. The trail grade here from a low point to the next high point, and then from that low point to the next high point uh, averages 13%. So we're, we're safely in the ballpark in this case. This trail should be sustainable over time. The trail anatomy that we looked at before uh, is intended to facilitate laminar flow or sheet drainage. And that's what the aqua colored lines are illustrating is water coming from upslope hitting the trail, but flowing across the trail to continue on its way. Just a real quick shout out here about soil. It's, it's entirely its own topic and it's a, an extensive one, but I wanted to at least mention uh, that soil is the backbone of trails and coarse sales or soils, um, are definitely our friends uh, because they have larger pore space between um, the particulates of the soil for water to pass through and infiltrate into the ground. Uh, sand is an example. Loam can be an example. Uh, on the other end of the scale, clay and silt is a very fine grain soil and it does they don't really leave enough space for water to drain through and it'll infiltrate into the ground. That's where we see standing water. And with even a small amount of precipitation or even a heavy fog, uh, the trails that are predominantly clay become very slippery. Soils to be continued. So let's take a short, let's take a short break. Uh, maybe it's a time to get up, move around, take a bathroom, run, uh, get some more coffee. And if anyone has any, wants to stick around for the next five minutes and have uh, questions, um, I'd love to hear them. So we'll, we'll start up the rest of the program in five minutes. Um, and if you have questions, um, let's hear them in the meanwhile. Anybody out there?
Good morning, Tim. Charlie calling. Um, yeah, great presentation. Question I have, a section of the trail, which I maintain, has a lot of slope down to a creek, and it has a lot of rock, almost like rock scree. And when I cut trees or I'm moving rocks, I tend to move them to the lower side to prevent erosion of the trail because it's very close to the slope that goes down to the creek. Is that appropriate? How close to the lower side of the trail do you move them? Uh, right on the edge, because sometimes the trail just, it, the ground drops off right at the trail's edge. Perhaps uh -huh. the trail's not built back far enough. Okay. I wouldn't say what you're doing is wrong necessarily. Uh, it seems like it could be a good stopgap practice. What you may need to look at is doing formalizing more of a stone retaining wall uh, to retain the tread in the location that it is. If a small realignment is not in the cards. Also, the way that you organize the rock on the downslope side of the tread will have an effect. Uh, if you place the rock in more of a random pattern over a little bit broader of an area, more like a rubble field or riprap, um, that will help slow water on its way to the creek, which is good, um, and give it a chance to infiltrate. How does that sound? That, that's helpful. Great advice. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Ah, there's a chat. <laughs> Thanks for your chat, Candace. Hey, Tim, uh, this is Matt here. Hey, Matt, how are you? Good, good. Um, figured I'd throw in. Sorry about that. We had some multiple computers on. Apologize. Um, just curious to fill, fill a minute here. What's been your favorite section of the SHT to work on with your time with us? Uh, so far, the two sections that I've worked on have been the split rock area and uh, up by Bean and Bear Lakes in Tetaguchi. And I really enjoyed them both. Um, let's see, next week, uh, Saturday, I'll be in Duluth uh, for part two of these trainings for a day. Uh, overall, I think I've I haven't, I haven't seen a lot or hiked a lot of the Superior Hiking Trail, maybe I'd say at most 30 miles. So I'm looking forward to, to seeing and, and hiking and working on more of it over time.
So if uh, folks ready to get started again? Yes? We've got about a, a half hour left uh, and hopefully include time for more input from you with quite a way still here to go. Uh, next up, we're gonna hone in a little bit on properties of water and keeping people on and water off of the trail. So question for you, look up and away from your screen and think, if I'm a raindrop, where do I go? <laughs> well, uh, the slide, now, if you're, if you're back looking at your screen, uh, think of being that raindrop and flowing through three different tiers. Uh, tiers are energy flows that occupy spaces above us, below us, and at the surface. So the upper tier is the home of uh, wind and air and fluids. Uh, for example, have you ever been in a light rainstorm, had it stop raining, and then you know, you're not feeling or seeing any raindrops around you, but then you start to feel some drops coming from the tree canopy, or you've, um, you're stationary and not feeling any wind or breeze, and you look up or around and you see the movement of trees overhead. That's the upper tier. And what it's telling us, well, I'll hold on to that one for a second. Uh, the middle tier, that's where we're most comfortable because that's at our eye level, that's sort of uh, our realm, um, our occupancy place in the world. And the lower tier is what's below our feet. And the lower tier very greatly influences a trail that rests directly on top of the lower tier. Wow, lots of energy there. We've got four boxes on the screen, top left. This is, this is the formula. It's not uh, Einstein's E equals MC squared but it's an important one for the trail realm, which is volume plus velocity equals damage. So what that means to us is if we can reduce the volume of water on the trail, we're gonna reduce damage. If we can reduce the speed or the velocity that water is moving on trail, we're going to reduce damage. If we don't, we're at the mercy of the, those natural forces. Uh, bottom left, fact, water just does not like to change directions. Uh, stubborn, it'll keep going against uh, a formidable hard surface such as uh, Niagara Falls, for example, uh, for eons until it finally breaks through. Uh, uh, on trail, if it's moving, it does not want to get off the trail. Why? Bottom right, it, water clings to itself and it clings to other surfaces as well. Um, I guess an analogy would be clicks, people, groups that uh, uh, are kind of sheltered within themselves. That's a bit how water is. It uh, just wants to stay water molecules will group together and they're hard to pull apart, uh, which is why it doesn't like to change directions. And then top right, water takes on the shape of its container. So when we see uh, trail surfaces that are cupped or U-shaped, water is right at home in those surfaces. It says, yeah, I'll stay here. I'll go to the end of the line in this shape and um, darn right, I'm not gonna get out of it. I'm not gonna change my directions. This is good for me because I'm going downhill. I'm getting there fast and uh, I like it. Here's a few examples. Um, top left, 
exposed roots like considerably this this is a little bit treacherous uh to walk um particularly for the setting which is a uh, minnesota state park and the roots are daylighted and that's a very obvious example of soil movement soil loss and erosion when that trail was established almost guaranteed those roots were not visible uh, from the middle tier middle picture doesn't take a lot of explanation i don't think uh, that's uh, a pretty well incised very much eroded section of trail and why two primary reasons that i think we can surmise uh, at least from what we're seeing here is that water is not cheating across the trail probably never did um, and it's a it's a steep trail grade so water is going where it wants to go and it's taking soil with it the uh, right hand picture uh, similar uh, definitely being trenched or becoming entrenched it's about a foot deep um, of soil loss and movement and in fact uh, we just worked there last week uh, to rehab that as part of the split rock bridge project and we'll see a little bit uh, of what we did towards the end of the show water characteristics of erosion water seeks the path of least resistance you bet uh, it'll take the easy way any any time it can for us as trail stewards um, as trail managers our task is to work with the direction that water wants to go here are some examples or some clues that we can use in our forensics explorations from the left this uh trying to get my cursor back up here yep there we go left hand picture this light colored patch that's an indication of water coming down the trail and depositing the uh, lighter soil type always look for different colors of or shades of soil on top of the tread. It'll be a very good clue as to what water is doing. Um, second picture to the right where my cursor is here. Clumps of leaves, twigs, clumps and patterns of vegetation on the trail is a very clear example and shows us it's like the footprints of water. Uh, very informative. Uh, third picture. At the top, we see that water was trying to get off the trail up by the tree, but the trail didn't allow it. And so it, it said, okay, no, no problem, folks. I'll uh, just keep coming down because this is easy. It's trying to get off here, but the edge of the trail won't allow it to happen. So it says, okay, I'll keep going. And in fact, you know, I'm getting hungry. So I'll take a little bit more soil here with us. And that's the pattern. Those are the footprints, the forensics of what's happening on this particular piece. And lastly, the right-hand side, uh, similar to the example we just discussed, water is trying to get off in this part of the trail and is blocked because the trail is burned and so it just continues down the slope for us as trail stewards what do we what does this mean for us it says okay if, if we've got limited time limited uh, resources behind us we need to look uh, and try to discern where water is trying to get off the trail and then evaluate what we can do to help it get off the trail at those places. Remember, 
the key to uh, water management and erosion control is to take a little water from as many places as we can, because we're not looking at a silver bullet, we're looking at an aggregate, uh, the cumulative amount of water that we can get off of a trail's surface. Uh, real briefly on subsurface water, seeps uh, in particular, and uh, areas at the toes of slope, uh, seasonal wet areas um, are really tricky. Um, in most cases, like full bench trail construction does not, is not the answer here. Uh, we need as much vegetation as, as we can support in these areas to absorb and retains to absorb water and retain soil. And often uh, these type of cases require some hardening of the surface, whether that's like a stone patio, whether that's an elevated boardwalk or a puncheon, or <laughs> often a different location for the trail, a different alignment. Time and use, uh, the big factors with erosion. And two on the right hand side of this screen, compaction and displacement. And compaction is the downward force of a user's weight uh, on the tread surface. So if you can see my hands, the my palm is representing the trail surface, and compaction is like beating the the top of the trail or the surface of the trail with a hammer uh, all day long. And what happens is with that force, the trail begins to bend. Uh, it begins to become cup-shaped uh, or U-shaped. Displacement, we'll go back to my hand example. This is the trail. I'm happily walking along. With each step I take, a few grains of soil are moving to the side. Over time, uh, they accumulate and that horizontal movement of tread of material uh, caused by friction and horizontal force and speed of movement and torque uh, increases that displacement and then the displacement gathers at the edge of the trail. Some wind comes along, some rain comes along, and moves it even further. So all of this that we've just looked at is leading to the concept of being hydrologically invisible, which is that water is doing the same thing it was doing before the trail was established. As it is doing while the trail is in use. That's a, that's a perfect world. And we can move very close to that uh, with our techniques and efforts. So burns, going back to compaction and displacement. Uh, this is just trying to illustrate. So here's the trail, that surface that we're walking on, the tread. The red shape in the top picture, that is a berm. And deberming sections of trail is one of the absolute best things from a uh, trail stewardship thing that we can do to get water off the trail. Bottom image is showing water standing on the trail or not exiting because it's being captured where the red arrow shows on the right hand side by what? A berm. Take off that berm, this blue shape keeps going down slope. I just want to at least mention drainage dips. It's a little bit more, uh, it takes a little bit more skill to do a drainage dip, whereas deberming is something you can do uh, almost at any time with a pigmatic or a rogue hoe, or even your feet uh, kicking away at accumulated soil at the edge of the trail. So drainage dips, are blockbusters. Um, they can remove a lot of water from the trail 
and they're, they do require ongoing maintenance uh, because as water, if you see my cursor now, it's coming down here. Where we want it to exit is by the yellow shape, uh, not necessarily at the trench. The trench is the fail safe. And much like the back line on tread, it's the hinge from which these other five components um, are based off of. This is the area that needs maintenance on drainage features, the outfall to keep water moving. And uh, drainage dips are designed to be self-cleaning. Uh, they should be built to be self-cleaning, meaning that water is moving fast enough. Here's where velocity helps us uh, to keep moving through that structure and to carry sediment with it. Next is an example of one uh, of a drainage dip. Uh, on the left, kind of a clumsy attempt here, but bear with me. That's where water is wanting to go. This is uh, the trail setting is North Central Wisconsin. It, this few feet was a logging road. There was no place to get water off the trail on the sides. And so we built this drainage dip. And the dip is reinforced with rock. Picture on the right shows where water is going. This was built about uh, 12, 11, 12 years ago. And it's performing beautifully today. That's a little bit of an example. And just wanted to at least plant that seed. Uh, this is from Tetaguchi State Park from a training that I was fortunate to uh, do with and for the Superior Hiking Trail Association last year. The picture on the left is what the trail is where we started. It's the before. And this was the last day of a four day session. Uh, we had about, I think it was about eight people. And I really wanted to, to bring in the drainage dip uh, and a minor trail realignment to uh, give people a taste of what that can do uh, on an existing section of trail. So that's where we started. Where was water flowing? If you see my cursor, it was flowing here. We see all of the exposed rock. Uh, there is an uh, opportunity for water to exit the trail on the side uh, because of the shape of the trail. So what we did, uh, we started first with vegetative clearing to give us uh, a visual and some breathing room and space to work uh, to do some shaping of soil. And that's what that looked like over here. The tree where my cursor is for the blue blaze the iconic blue blaze uh, on the right hand side there is the same tree as here. So what we did was we were able to get some water off where my cursor is here. And then we did this drainage dip and we disguised it uh, from users using stone uh, because the instinct of users, that was the old route. Uh, would be to continue just going A to B straight down the slope. So we wanted instead to nudge the use to the left um, to give water maximum opportunity to get off the trail here and then continue with outslope of the trail into this area. Uh, going back, Charlie, this is, I think, related uh, to what your question was in my response, uh, not exactly, but it's the general idea. So we want water to flow across the trail here. And we did this, uh, this rock, which could be scattered out broader and, and should have, should be, uh, to just stabilize that slope and slow water as it's off the trail, uh, being responsible stewards. The stone step uh, was a quickie and the rock on the side uh, is a pinner or uh, a little bit of a sidewall. That's for trail identity. That's to help guide users, to give them an intuitive, nonverbal signal that, hey, this is where I need to go and the step 
also helps with a little bit of the elevation change at that point. Picture on the left, also some stone steps. Um, and in fact, they are stable, uh, but they are way undersized and people aren't using them. Um, same with many stairs and oftentimes punching in particular for structures. If they are undersized, people will walk around them. And in uh, back to our picture on the left, water is not able to sheet off to the side of the trail. Uh, users with compaction and displacement are walking around the stones and that is giving water an easier path and it's taken it and it's taken soil. So the general rule of thumb with stone steps or structures, if are designed width of the trail is, is let's say 24 inches at very, very minimum, a stone step or steps, maybe it's two steps uh, side by side or two rocks to create one step uh, needs to be at least 24 inches, but the best case, and this should be your flag, your target, uh, is that the width of a constructed feature should be 50% greater in width than the design tread standard. Picture on the right, <clears throat> chaos. Uh, no trail definition. People uh, and rightly so, I have just over the last two and a half weeks, I walked this section of trail up and down at least once, if not twice or more a day, uh, are picking their own route. And that's to be expected uh, given the routes, et cetera. So moving on with some other examples of people on water off, uh, this is Cascade River State Park. Lots going on here. Don't know the whole story. Can identify some things uh, between the rope, uh, which says, hey, I'm not supposed to take, take this route. I don't know why <laughs> I'm not, because it sure looks like it's a, a, a good way to go uh, versus picking my way through these roots and whatnot. And if I'm trying to go to the left, uh, you know, that makes sense to me. Um, but there is a management reason for it. And the rope is communicating that at least to trail users. So obstacles. Obstacles in the tread, people will step around. Uh, and in doing so, that's how trails widen. Uh, there's an adage, Fat Albert and Sexy Sadie. Fat Albert says that a poorly designed trail will widen over time. And Sexy Sadie says that a well-designed trail will narrow over time. And there's certainly some merit um, to both what Albert and Sadie have to say in that area. Picture on the left, hillside seats. Uh, I'm to get my cursor up here. Standing water. Um, it's a tough one. Uh, this has since been mitigated with a portion of uh, punching, it's about 20 feet long, where the standing water was, and that certainly helps. Picture on the right, uh, same area, split rock section of trail, it's got mud, it's got standing water, it's got seeps to refresh the mud, and it's got a full length uh, down tree blocking the edge of the water, so even if water was trying to get off, uh, the down tree is stopping it. So on the right-hand side, uh, that's not the size of, of uh, bucked material that I was suggesting early on that you try to move, uh, but it's representative of how uh, trees that we've cut and bucked up 
uh, to keep the trail open and passable, which is 100% thumbs up. Uh, when we just leave them at the edge of the trail, uh, it can then interrupt the flow of water and make it harder for uh, the next maintainer to come along and try to make a positive change for the trail. Just a couple of more here, and then we'll have uh, hopefully some questions coming. So trail shape on the left, uh, this is about a 15 year old section of trail. And intuitively, you may think when first looking at it, well, why don't I just take this path? It's you know more direct, probably not missing anything uh, scenically in, in that short stretch. And it doesn't look like a second growth or fourth growth uh, woods that we're in. But instead, with this trail shape, uh, we have a place for water to exit the trail here. If we keep the outslope of the trail, we have a place for water to exit through here. Uh, we have a place for water to exit here. Uh, so we've added, you know, at least four zones for water to get off the trail. We've added some stone from a trail identity standpoint and to guide users non-verbally. Uh, and we've added a little bit of interest just because it's more fun to take this kind of uh, pattern of movement than it is straight up and down, or at least it is for many people, more fun. Picture on the right, mud, uh, cathro muck. Uh, so I'm including this just from the standpoint of, yes, it could use a whole lot more of this type of hardening. Uh, these are small stones. They've got good mass, but not very much size. So when faced with that kind of a situation, which is often um, grouping them, using them together to create more than the sum of its parts, is a really effective strategy. And this hardens the surface. We're not importing lumber, buying lumber. Uh, and it's a good tactic to use for muddy sections of trail. Uh, getting close here, uh, image 42 of 44. And I would be remiss if, if not bringing in trail signage as a component of keeping people on uh, the trail. It's very important. It's uh, definitely a, a, a pet peeve of mine and, or not a peeve, but uh, uh, I totally geek out with trail signage. Uh, I think it's, it's very critical. And, and the majority of, of what we've looked at uh, up to this point, in the, in the technical and in trail features side of things, largely goes unnoticed by the hiking public. Um, but that's not the case with trail signage. Uh, signage gives trail users confidence that they are on the trail and on the trail that they think they are and definitely add to the quality of the trail experience. So. Uh, Superior Hiking Trail Association, I think, has long paid close attention to signage, and I like what the SHTA does. And now that uh, SHT is formally part of the National Scenic Trail System as an affiliate with the North Country Trail, uh, hallelujah, congratulations to both parties. <laughs> um, there are excellent resources from the North Country Trail Association uh, to access as well from NCTA's website about trail signage and many, many other things. And on the Superior Hiking Trail website, uh, kudos to SHTA for in 2020 releasing a trail maintenance manual. I highly recommend uh, that if your principal involvement with trails is the Superior Hiking Trail, that you seek this out and at least download it and uh, have fun with it, enjoy it. There's a lot to be gained from this. And I also uh, think there's, uh, it's been updated 
with a few changes in 2021. I just happened to have the 2020 version um, to get an image of it here for you. So with that, uh, we've got a few minutes for questions. Um, and really, thank you so much for taking part of your Friday morning here with me uh, to talk about trail sustainability, uh, trail stewardship, caring for the trail, and uh, building and maintaining and stewarding uh, a resilient superior hiking trail. This is the project we just finished at Split Rock. You don't see all of the work, but uh, you know, bridges are sexy. So that's what that's what's being shown here. So so thank you again. Uh, maybe I'll see you tonight or tomorrow uh, with the trail eyes, uh, developing a, pl a plan for trail assessment and sustainability for the Superior Hiking Trail. And if so, I look forward to it. Thanks again. Awesome, thanks, Tim. If anyone has questions, feel free to either put them in the chat box or you can just go ahead and chime in. We'll give folks a, a minute to, to get brave to ask their question. Yeah. <laughs> Don't have any fear, folks. All <laughs> questions are good. All comments are good. Thank you. You are welcome. Hi, Tim, I had a question. Awesome. Um, I know you talked a little bit about uh, like berms on the trail and how you can um, like kind of help with that a little bit. I was just wondering if you're like, if you're just out like hiking by yourself or whatever, don't have like a ton of tools or whatever, like are there like one or two like main things that you would recommend that you can like look for and do to kind of improve situations like that with berms and other drainage issues? Yes, absolutely. Uh, a first, tune up your trail eyes a little bit and try to recognize um, what the source of the problem is. And what that means to us is we tend to focus on just the trouble spot, but before you start working specifically on that trouble spot, walk past it, walk up and down the trail, see what's happening, you know, like for 50 or a hundred feet at least, um, in both directions from, from the problem spot. And also look to your sides, right and left, look up slope and look down slope. See what you can uh, discern from where water is coming from. And um, just give yourself a little time to do that. And then let's say you're out there and you see, okay, uh, the outside edge of the trail is higher than the inside edge of the trail for example, uh, and you don't have any tools with you. Uh, well, I'm pretty famous for like really pawing around with my feet. Uh, you can do a little bit of that at least just with your feet at the very edge of the trail uh, or maybe pick up small diameter uh, brush that's at the trail edge uh, and move it off or those logs that I mentioned, any obstructions that you can really see, uh, I would do so. I would, I would not dive into trying to move rock right off the bat until you understand the site maybe a little bit better. If you were going to go out with tools, a pigmatic is, is the bomb. Uh, that's really, really, really good. And the nice thing about it is it's a two part tool. You can take the head of it off, which weighs about five pounds uh, and pack it. And then you can pack the handle too, which is 36 inches long. So it is mobile uh, and it's a little bit of a step up, I think from, from your question. Uh, but just something to keep in mind. Does that help or tell me more? Yeah, that's what I was looking for. Um, 
let's <laughs> I already have like a, in my pack I've usually been carrying uh, like the, a folding saw like that the silky like I don't think it's nice. the exact one you're talking about but I've yeah. that and a, a lopper now I've been carrying too nice. uh, so is there anything like maybe kind of a middle stage that's not quite the full yes. pragmatic like to yeah. cause I already have a bunch of stuff yes uh, here it is a hand trowel perfect thank you you bet Tim, we had a question come through on chat from Candice who wants to know, how do you prioritize what sections of trail to redo? Uh, I, I know what SHTA has been doing, but what, what would your recommendations be for, for, for us? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, and then what I'm looking for right now is the shortest answer uh, for it, prioritizing. So doing an honest assessment of what your capacity is. So like to the gentleman with the previous question, it's an individual um, who's looking to, you know, make a little bit of an improvement um, on, on their own. And that is welcome. So what's within your capacity? Carrying a hand trowel, small folding saw, and, and work within your capacity and work safely uh, because we want you back. So I would prioritize um, largely at least on, on the scale that I'm talking about right now, uh, from the standpoint of what, what can you do, whether individually or as a small group, that you'll see the results of your efforts with the amount of time that you have. So take small chunks and do them well, do them to completion um, and be realistic. And then the last thing I would say about it is take before and after pictures uh, to learn from for yourself. Uh, well, that wasn't quite the last thing. The last thing I'll say is talk as well, share your thoughts, ideas, lesson learned, aspirations with the staff of the Superior Hiking Trail Association. Try not to become a lone ranger. Um, I'm a huge believer in the multiplier effect and that multiplier effect happens when you get more hands around, more hands and more heads and more hearts around a problem than only our own. Awesome, thank you. Thank you so much, Tim, for for your wisdom today, for joining us. Thanks to everyone who came to learn more about this. We really do need, you know, all a lot of help out there and a lot of people who are aware of, of the challenges that we're, we're facing. We will follow up with, uh, with everyone with an email, uh, a link to the recording if you want to, you know, check something out again. There are still a few spaces open if you'd like to come to a real life training with Tim, uh, not this weekend, but next. So you can email info at superiorhiking.org to connect with us and we'll see where we can, where we can fit you in. And if you're you know, brand new to the Superior Hiking Trail Association, you can visit our website at superiorhiking.org and figure out you know, how to get involved with our community. Stewardship looks uh, different for a lot of different people and we'll find a way that, that works for you. So we're grateful to all of you. So grateful to Tim, thank you again. And we really appreciate it. Have a great day, everyone. Same to you, thanks so much. Take care. <laughs>